We're here with Inside the Zone Week 8 of the high school football season here in Indiana. Justin Kinney of Optimal Performance Sports. We got a lot to talk about because, uh, again, after this Friday night, we got one more week and we're on to the postseason. Yes, sir. It's gone by quickly, but, man, conference races, if they haven't been decided, and in most cases they haven't, um, it's going to come down to either this Friday night or next Friday night. And I want to start off with it. it I want to start off with the SAC yeah, because it is the talk of the town <laughs> and it it's been crazy because you take a look last week at the Battle of the Bishops. It was SAC rivalry week, mm -hmm. a one point game. I know you were there yep. uh, for the ending. Bishop Lures winning against Dwenger in overtime by one point. Kyle Lindsay decided to go for two. Yep. Gambling man and it pays off. Did. And man, Lures is in the driver's seat with only two games left. And that includes this week's game. Uh, and the Battle of Calhoun uh, against Southside, and then at Homestead in Week 9. Can you believe what you just saw, <laughs> Justin Kenny? Well, it's amazing. Here we are in week uh, year one of the new SAC format, and we already have some some chaos, some craziness with the with Lures now in in the in the small division, if that's what we're calling it, the B division. We don't have any official names. Mm -hmm. Sitting at five and zero, they are the only undefeated team in the league. You have Carol and Homestead, or excuse me, Carol and Snyder on the other side with one loss that Lures doesn't play. So they can clinch at least a share of the SAC championship with a win on Friday over the Archers and then can clinch it outright the week after. If you're a Bishop Lures fan, you love the fact that you're not playing the top two teams in the SAC. If you're fans of those two teams, you're angry that, that Bishop Lures doesn't have to play you. It depends on who you ask and how they like the rule or not, but when you factor in two non-conference weeks, you're going to have an unbalanced schedule, and it just so happens in year one of the format, we're having some chaos. Is this the best-case scenario, worst-case scenario? How do you see it playing out? Because I don't think we know until the postseason yeah. whether it was beneficial to have those two non-conference games at the beginning of the year or not, but it certainly has thrown a wrench in yes. what you would think would be a, a typical – SAC type of season where you see those powers at the top, the Snyders, the Carrolls, even though Lures, we know, uh, has been pretty good in the past. I think, what, 2021, they earned a share of the yep. title, and it was yep. about 10 years ago where they won it outright. Um, uh, 20, I think, yeah, 2011. 2011. Yeah, 2011. Was 2011? Won, I was thinking yeah. 2013. 2011. You've done the research. I'm yeah. just <laughs> spouting off the top of my head. Um, but, man, you, you have to feel good if you're Bishop Lures. Like, you – Granted, um, you haven't played Snyder and Carroll, but you, you've answered the bell. Yeah. I mean, they've played some close games, yeah. and they've come out victorious. And that only bodes well, not only for the SAC championship, but like in the postseason, yeah. uh, especially when you're playing 2A football, Lures is like, if it comes down to the wire, these guys know what it takes to yeah. win. It ain't always pretty, but they've been <laughs> able to pull it out. All that matters is winning, and you're 3-0 yes. and in games decided by three points or less this season. And not only are Lures fans now looking at potentially wrapping up at least a share of the victory bell this weekend, all of a sudden they're looking ahead and going, okay, well, in 2A, who's matching up with this? Mm -hmm. You look at Eastside, they're down comparatively to what they have been. Still a good team. You look at Bluffton that was number one, and they lose. And you say, okay, maybe if you see them in a regional, you could match up well with them. And the top three teams right now in 2A are all in the South. So you're kind of looking at it going, it's getting way ahead of the horse, trust me. Mm -hmm. But Bishop Lures fans are all of a sudden looking at, okay, how, how deep can we go? But it, it all comes back to with the format. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So how long have we heard about people saying, well, you need non-conference games? The SAC, Carroll and, and Snyder and Homestead, they need to be playing the best of the best. And you need to get Bishop Lures playing some like-sized teams, Concordia, well, you can't have that mm -hmm. and then also have a balanced schedule in the SAC. There's just not enough games. So you got what you wanted with the non-conference games, and now you have a problem with how the SAC is being decided. You can't have both of them. I like that. You, you, you can't have your cake and eat it, no, too. That's a can't. really good way to put it. Hey, thanks. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, this week's big matchup in the SAC. We got Snyder versus Dwenger. If you're Snyder, to have any hope of winning a, a, a piece of the victory bell, you need a victory this week against Dwenger. And we've seen Dwenger also answer the bell. They were on the ropes against Homestead a few weeks ago, uh, one at Shields Field. This one is going to be at Shields Field, as, Shields Field as well. So what do you really see as being the key? Because if you're the Snyder Panthers, like, you go in being like, we got to take care of business. Right. you got to come in and be businesslike, like you were against Northrop last week. I think you look at maybe the potential for Bishop Dwenger to have a chance in this game is slowing down that running attack. That's mm -hmm. what Homestead was able to do and forced Snyder offensively to do some things they're not accustomed to doing. And Bishop Dwenger did a really good job against Bishop Lures from stopping the run or at least slowing it down. I mean, they, they Lures averaged on the night just 1.4 yards per carry. 
so the the uh, the run for the two point conversion win that was one and a half yards after the uh, the pass interference penalty was more than they averaged for the night. So Bishop Dwenger did a really good job on Friday, but it's a bit another step up with Snyder and that and that offensive front. So can they do that? Hold the point of attack, slow down your Ivy Cannon and that running game. That'll be the key for Dwenger to hang around. And if you're Carroll, you're like, hey man, like. Don't forget about, what us. about us. We made the 6A state finals <laughs> last year. Uh, they've they've had an up and down season, um, but when you take a look at last week against Homestead, they went 41 to 20. It was 17 to zero after the first quarter. Is that a get right game for them? Where now they've kind of flipped the switch. You think maybe going forward uh, they've got Northrop this week, and then they have Northside in week nine. Yeah. So for Carroll, are you feeling a little bit better about what you've got after you win a rivalry game relatively decisively last Friday night? Well, I have to think you're feeling better than what you did the last couple weeks uh, coming out of Friday nights because either you're losing or just looking kind of ugly and doing it. And this was a dominant performance by, by Carroll. We saw Jimmy Sullivan uh, get back to what he does best, using his legs, using his arms, goes for over 400 total yards in that okay. game. You have some injuries for Carroll, and they were notable on Friday, missing some guys, but they were still dominant in that rivalry game. So if you're Carroll, a Carroll fan, or even a Carroll coaches, you're saying, okay, now we go forward from here, a complete performance, and now this is where our baseline is going into the 6A playoffs because it's not going to be easy mm -mm. when you have Penn luring, lurking in there in that sectional. You have Warsaw as well. Mm. So Wishbone. If, you got to prepare for the bone. So for Carroll, it's not going to be as easy of a road as maybe it was last year when you had a down Penn team mm -hmm. by Penn standards. And, a, and I think this Warsaw team is better than they were last year. So you're going to have to be ready from the jump in sectional if you're going to make a deep run if you're Carroll. Let's talk about the Northeast State because that's where our game of the week lies. We've been real Northeast State heavy. Talk a lot about the Northeast yeah. State. We featured it a lot on the highlight zone. We're going to have to do it again this week because this feels like the de facto any eight championship game. I know there's a week after this and anything can happen, but you're talking about New Haven at East Noble. These are two of the three or four teams we talked about at the beginning of the season having a chance for the conference title. Yeah. New Haven comes in undefeated in conference play. East Noble has one loss uh, in conference play. So what do you really see as being the, the key this coming Friday night up in Kendallville? Well, man, I, I know New Haven is undefeated, but I don't think there was a, a, a win as, as impressive in the NE8 this season as what we saw out of East Noble going to Columbia City and getting mm -hmm. a shutout last Friday. Yeah. I mean, that caught us all by surprise. Not necessarily that East Noble won, but shutting out Columbia City yeah. and being able to run for 250 yards on that defense and holding Columbia City 150 yards under its rushing average. Phenomenal performance. Now they are at home taking on New Haven. New Haven wants to come in. They'll have Milan Graham back, and they want to spread the field and attack downfield. East Noble wants to make it ugly, right? They want to run three, four, five yards. Xander Brazel keep the defense honest with his arm. So we'll see if New Haven gets sucked into kind of a, a between-the-tackles, just grind-it-out type game or if they're able to open things up, protect Donovan Williams and let him work. I think those are the keys for this one. Yeah, and if you're East Noble, you're like, we're playing pretty good football. Right, like, right. You know, yeah. it's, it feels like we kind of took notice of East Noble in the first couple of games where they beat up on Lures pretty good in week one and then uh, suffered a loss against Snyder in week two. And it feels like we haven't talked a yeah. lot about them. Um, but, man, you're, you're mentioning that 35-0 to victory last week against Columbia City. They're just really playing smash-mouth football. Yeah. And then Xander Brassel occasionally will make a, a big play in the throwing game to, to, to break it wide open. And the defense really is what impressed me. Yeah. You know, they obviously, you score zero points. They hold Stratton Fuller. They held uh, the entire Columbia City offense mm -hmm. uh, to zero points. So you have to be pretty impressed with last week's performance if you're Luke Amstutz. And it's a defense that held Leo to just 14 points yeah. in that loss. So you're looking at a shootout that was at Leo between the Lions and New Haven, and you're going, okay, like common opponent. Uh, was Leo and East Noble's defense really shut that Leo offense down comparatively. So there's a big challenge for New Haven to go in there. I think they want to be able to win the battles downfield. Don't get sucked in, like I said, to a, a game where you're just trading three, four, five yard runs. Uh, the matchups, if East Noble plays them the way New Haven wants, then it falls into New Haven's hands. But you know Coach Amstutz is going to have a game plan ready to go and try to take New Haven out of what it wants to do. And if you're Leo, you're like, again, hey, hey look hey, at us hey, over here. What about us, man? We're 4-1. and one. Yeah. They've got a home game against Columbia City this week. That'll be another big game in the Northeast State. If Leo wants to have a share of the NEA title, they have to win against Columbia City this week. They do. You think if you're Columbia City, this is a chance for us to bounce back. But also, if you're Leo, you're looking, this is a, a way for us to really be in a position that if New Haven falls, we can tie for the, the conference championship. So 
It's a de facto championship game for Leo in the sense that if they suffer a second loss, they're not going to have a shot. And for Columbia City, they wanted to try to put the memories of last week especially out of mind because the loss to New Haven, really close game, was closer than the final score indicated. Last, last week, they just weren't in it from the jump. And uh, they're hoping to bounce back, but it doesn't get any easier for them having to go to Leo. To me, it's crazy thin how far the margin has been for mm -hmm. Leo because you're talking about they've got two losses. Week one is a road loss where they led at halftime against yeah. a good Kokomo team. A team, I think, in Kokomo over the last couple of years, we've underrated how yeah. good that they've been. So they lose by two on the road in week one, and then they lose by one in overtime you know, based on a PAT to New Haven. And we're kind of talking like they're not in the yeah, conversation yeah. as much, but it's like that's three points is the difference between them being undefeated. It is, and I think we, we, we fall into that too. It's easy to say, well, okay, so Snyder beat Carroll, so they're better than, than Carroll. But if they play ten times, maybe they each win five times. Same thing with Leo and New Haven. It's just on that particular night, they weren't able to pull it out. It doesn't mean they're not the best or most complete team in the conference. It's just that they didn't have it that night. So – we're so quick to label teams and, and put this team is better than this team is better than this team because of wins and losses, but it doesn't always turn out like that. And we see it often, too, with, with the second time around with similar opponents. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to beat a team twice in a season if the talent level and the skill level is pretty close, and, and that's a reason because you play these te teams any number of times and both teams are going to have plenty of wins. Heading into last week, uh, I was kind of wondering if Bluffton was going to be able to hang mm -hmm. on and beat Heritage, and then we'd have a matchup of undefeated teams, essentially, for the ACAC championship. Uh, Tigers gave it a ride, uh, it and it went down to the wire, but uh, Kobe Myers touched down with about a minute to go, and a subsequent fumble uh, on a hook and ladder from Bluffton uh, did in the Tigers. Yeah. 27 to 21 out of 3A team, that's pretty good. You got them going to Adam Central now, the Bluffton Tigers, and the game for Adam Central, you know, they beat Heritage 38-0 to a few weeks ago. How do you see this one playing out? Can Bluffton hang in this game? Because uh, it's going to be bonkers in Bluffton no yeah. matter whether it's the game of the <laughs> week or not uh, because this is the best Tigers team we've seen in quite some time. How do they bounce back? Yeah. And I don't necessarily look at this as Bluffton needs to get a win, but they can't get rolled off the field because one loss can turn into two losses, can turn into three losses pretty quick because you have to play Lakeland next week, yep. a team that has only two losses and almost beat West Noble. So – all of a sudden, you look at Bluffton and say, we need to stop the bleeding. We need to put last week out of mind and prepare for the best team we're going to face in the regular season by a significant margin. So can Bluffton win this game? I don't know if they can, but you don't want to be rolled off the field 42-6. to six. Mm -hmm. You really want to be able to bounce back and have a complete effort and put up a fight against the Flying Jets. So I think that is the storyline that I'm watching is can Bluffton learn from last week, put it out of their mind, and come out and play a really good football game, or does one loss turn into two losses with a road game at Lakeland next week? And it feels, I know at the beginning of the season we were saying, man, AC doesn't look like the old AC. AC doesn't look like the team that's just yeah. rolling people. If AC does come out and beat Bluffton relatively handily, are, are they back to the old AC? Because yeah. really the last couple of weeks they've kind of looked like it. Yeah. I mean, once we saw the Heritage game, it was like, ooh, maybe it just took them a while to get going, but this looks like the same old thing that Michael Mosier has yeah. going down with AC so far. And that's one thing that we see with, with Michael Mosier is they're not putting 60, 70 points on people. Usually they get up and they hit around 40, 45, and they're like, all right, like, well, we're done. We're going to put some other guys in. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we see even last week against Southern Wells. They, they could have easily put up 70 if they wanted to, but they didn't. So I think we're rounding into form with AC. I think you've seen Jack Hamilton outperform even the highest expectations that we had for him, taking over that, that quarterback position and being able to run the offense. He's been phenomenal. The offensive and defensive lines have been good, getting healthy as well there. And so it looks like a team that with every week is returning to form. And we almost take them for granted a little bit, too. Mm -hmm. is if, if, if AC doesn't win by 50, we're like, what's wrong with Adam Central, which speaks to their dominance in this league. Yeah, Jack Hamilton throws a nice deep ball. He does. It helps that his receivers are open a lot of the time. Yeah. I mean, you got to be able to throw it. I mean, three passes, two go for touchdowns on Friday. He's doing okay. He's, 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 he's yeah, and adds another element, especially. I'm not trying to put the cart in front of the horse, but you get down to Indianapolis mm -hmm. and they limit your run game, let's say. They try to take that away. You've got to be able to do something else, and that uh, may be the case this coming season. Uh, West Noble our, was our game of the week against Lakeland last week, and it really it lived it up delivered. to the hype. Yeah. It goes to overtime. It's a one-point game for the conference championship, and West Noble and Monty Mayhorter come out victorious. It was lit in Ligonier. <laughs> um, but Lakeland also provided, a, a, you know, a, 
Braden Holbrook and what they've got at, at Lakeland. Ryan O'Shea comes from a great coaching lineage. They got a lot going on, headed in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your takeaway from that game? Can you glean anything from that, knowing that West Noble did what they had to do and answered the bell when it came down to the, the final minutes and the final moments in overtime? Well, it shows that West Noble can execute when they need to. And with their dominance this year, you haven't had to see that very often. Mm -hmm. And for Coach Mayorder, you have to be happy to be able to see that because you don't want to go into the playoffs going, man, my team has yet to face adversity, has yet to face a game where they're up against it and have to execute late to win. And they were able to do that against Lakeland. So that has to make you feel good as a coach and saying, okay, this group and still young group, a lot mm -hmm. of juniors on that team is they were able to make the plays when they needed to in overtime and win. And it's amazing. The second game we've had this year coming down basically to a missed extra point. We had that with New Haven and Leo, and then we had it last Friday with West Noble and Lakeland. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, – this is flying under the radar a little bit, but I, I, I had to double-check my, my numbers on this. Central Noble is 3-0 mm -hmm. in the small division in the NECC. Eastside also 3-0. Mm -hmm. So it is the championship game for the NECC small division this week. Uh, you got Zach Baber, the new coach. Yep. You've got Alex Brandewee, the new coach, on the other sideline. Um, I guess I'm not surprised, perhaps, that Eastside – even though they had a coaching change and graduated, a lot of people have a lot of new faces in different roles, uh, is battling for a conference chi yeah. championship. But uh, good on Central Noble so far. How Last week that? beating Busco 24-12. Uh, how do you see this one playing out? Because uh, obviously the Blazers have the pedigree and have done it in years past, but Central Noble appears up and coming as far as uh, the Cougars go and Zach Baber's program in year one. Definitely would be a feather in the cap of whichever coach can clinch a division championship in his first season with Central Noble or Eastside, and it really lays the groundwork for going forward. So when you look at this game, and I think it comes down to that bulk of Eastside up front, mm -hmm. as can they really dominate the point of attack with that, that, that powerful offensive front, that defensive line as well. I think that could be the difference in this one. But don't sleep on Central Noble. They can make some plays. Uh, they've been maybe exceeded expectations to my expectations to start the year. We focus so much on Lakeland and West Noble for good reason. But both of those teams are like, hey, don't forget about us over here. They'll battle for a division title on Friday. Yeah, Central Noble started the season 0-3, and, and it was easy to just be like, ah, yeah, right? let's not pay attention to them. But they won three of their last four. And, and you know, I know Busco's kind of re, uh, reloading, refiring, rebuilding right now under Paul Sade. But, you know, the, bat the battle of borderline, they come out victorious to Central Noble. And Brody Morgan, I believe, became the Central Noble's all-time leading passer. How about that? I have to double-check that. But that's what I was told on the Twitter sphere. So, um, and Twitter sphere is always right, too. That's right. Yes. Um, what are you most looking forward to here about Week 8? Obviously, there are conference championship implications pretty much all across the board. Right. And also, you have to start thinking about playoff scenarios and where teams are at this point in the season as the postseason is really right around the corner. I think a lot of eyes will be on the NE8 this week for, for good reason with East Noble and New Haven, and then you have Columbia City going to Leo. So two teams, well, Columbia City trying to bounce back, and you have New Haven trying to continue their undefeated season and kind of clinch at least a share of the NE8. So all eyes will be on that. And then in the SAC, you just – you think you know what's going on, and every week there's the seemingly something that happens that catches you off guard. So can Bishop Lures wrap up at least a share? Can Carroll and Snyder play, uh, stay, play serve? And then Sunday we'll have the draw for the sectionals, which uh, seems amazing. But we'll have that on Sunday evening. Boom. Maybe. It's It's gone by fast. Yes. It's gone by fast, and, of course, we'll have it all covered for you on the Highlight Zone Friday night and then next Monday, week nine, Inside the Zone with Justin Kenny. But for now, I'm Glenn, and we'll see you next week.